Everyone, it's now 7.30, so we'll go ahead and get started. And uh, Dr. Burns has assured me his presentation is not going to go over, so I want to, uh, for, uh, sorry for the residents, but for the attendings here, there's a few housekeeping things that we want to uh, go over. Uh, so first of all, uh, I want to, uh, let me find what I, okay. I want to call uh, everybody's attention to the fact that these instructions I'm going to give right now, I may go through them relatively quickly. And if you're residents, you don't need to know these. But this would be useful for anybody who wants to watch this, watch instructions again. Is any you just come here to the index homepage, form with PCH for you. If you click on this link here, you can get our grand round schedule right here. And then if you go to archive CME right here, this will get you the talks in descending order. So this was like last uh, last Tuesday's grand rounds, and or or actually it's a. Uh, neurosurgery grand rounds, which we're, are now on these two. So if you click on one of these links, uh, then you can uh, uh, watch the grand rounds. And so for those of you out there in Zoom land who want to see what I'm about ready to show you, you can uh, get to it this way. So now uh, from this, uh, let me come to this one first. From this week to next week, the University of Arizona, which manages all of our CME, is going to get rid of this old CAM system that they've been using for years and go to a new one called Cloud CME, which is what all the other major children's hospitals are using. Uh, so it's gonna be a very good thing, but it's gonna be a change. So just wanted to uh, make sure everybody uh, who wants to, who is depending upon these CME credits, uh, knows what you, uh, what you can do now. So if you go to this uh, page, which I got to just by Googling University of Arizona CAM CME, uh, you can look down here, and then if you scroll down to this and you click attendance records and transcripts, uh, it will then ask you to log in, and then you will get to this page right here. And then if you put your start date and end date and submit search, it will look there and it will find all of the uh, uh, CME that you've gotten and uh, kind of have it here, and then you can also go generate a PDF transcript. So for you attendings out there, if you want to make sure all your credits are correctly uh, recorded, uh, you're welcome to do that today or tomorrow. And then I think Thursday, either Thursday or sometime soon after, uh, the uh, U of A is gonna pull the plug on this CAM system and nobody's ever gonna be able to get into it again. And then between now and our next grand rounds, uh, they're gonna have a new cloud CME. We'll all need to create a new account in that. But I think we will find that that will be uh, user-friendly and. Uh, a good uh, upgrade overall. So uh, with that, now I am going to uh, introduce our speaker this morning. And for those of you uh, residents, um, put this down here. Uh, Dr. Burns in his introduction here doesn't have how long he's been at Phoenix Children's, but uh, I've been here a long time. And when I was a resident, there were 12 of us interns per year. Uh, and we, when we got to be seniors, we would have senior morning report every week uh, when we were on the wards. And there were two attendings that were without fail always there unless they were out of town. Uh, one of them was Dr. Dale Singer, who's an oncologist. Uh, and one, the other one was Dr. Burns. So Dr. Burns precepted us not only with things neurological, but also, uh, you know, he was a pretty good general pediatrician and would have insightful things to say about kids with respiratory illnesses or anything else. Uh, and was very instrumental in helping us uh, young residents uh, become uh, uh, carry the weight. And back then, there were no attendings in house overnight. So when you were the senior resident, you were the uh, you were the one who uh, dealt with uh, anything that needed to be dealt with. And so anyway, now into our our introduction, uh, Dr. Burns. Uh, he's not as well known by residents nowadays because the place has grown so much, and he kind of has a specialized little niche but he's the director of our uh, neuromuscular program uh, at Phoenix Children's and with Barrows Neurological Institute. Uh, Dr. Burns has spent the majority of his career as an employee of Phoenix Children's after his initial pediatric neurology and neuromuscular disease training at Northwestern University in Chicago. He's established the neuromuscular program here at Phoenix Children's as a muscular dystrophy association clinic. It's also a cure spinal muscular atrophy registry and treatment center. And he obtained designation by the Parent Project uh, for Muscular Dystrophy, which is a PPMD organization, of Phoenix Children's Hospital being a certified Duchenne muscular uh, dystrophy, a Duchenne muscular treatment site. 
So all these things are very uh, prestigious uh, uh, things that not every children's hospital has been able to obtain. And, um, and, uh, and just to know that Dr. Burns is not just, he's not just a clinical doctor that sees patients, he's also a researcher here and uh, very much uh, uh, probably less known than he should be. His clinical research interest is primarily associated with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, spinal muscular atrophy, myasthenia, and rare neuromuscular presentations. Recent and ongoing clinical trials include cell-based mediated therapy, myostatin inhibitors, immune modulating therapy, and we're one of only two United States sites completing a trial for childhood CIDP, an ongoing phase two trial with a neonatal receptor antibody lowering monoclonal antibody trial for pediatric generalized myasthenia gravis, and exon skipping and stop codon treatments. He's been at Phoenix Children's for a long time now with a program of over 150 boys with Duchenne Becker's muscular dystrophy. And uh, these patients have been the impetus for his presentation. And also just to give a little perspective, when we were all residents, there were three neurologists here, Dr. Burns, Dr. Kaplan, and Dr. Haddon. And uh, he's the only one that's uh, still here in practice with us. So without further ado, Dr. Burns, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, John. That. All right. So Duchenne's muscular dystrophy is a rare disorder. Uh, and so sometimes it's hard to come to Grand Rounds and, and hear about a rare disorder. So I sort of uh, added the uh, history of PCH, which is um, uh, throughout, throughout the talk here. So if you try to Google uh, the history of PCH, you, you can't really find it. The history is not really well documented. You'll come up with this one page, which will have these major sort of topics and talk about hospital within a hospital, breaking new ground, and partnerships, expansion growth. And you'll see this building behind it, which is really poorly defined. Okay, so you're going to learn all about this as we go through. So my disclosures are, is that the majority of my career has been here. And the advances in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, care, diagnosis, treatment, have paralleled virtually the creation of this institution. Um, and when you talk about things that seem to be unrelated, I mean, the, the psychiatrists have a, a name for that. It's called transference. And I'm just going to plead guilty right now, and we can go on. So and the last thing is that the history of these stories that I'm going to talk to you about here are all true, but they're subject to my interpretation. All right. So the objectives are to reveal the changes in the diagnosis, care, and treatment of Duchenne's. And then I'm also going to talk about what I interpret as the important milestones in DMD as related to the creation of Phoenix Children's, the Great Flood, which most of you guys have not heard about, the merger, and the building of the hospital. And then at the end, I'm going to, I pick three topics that will um, review what I think is going to change routine pediatric care three aspects of Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, which will change the care of Duchenne's or, or change the care of, of general pediatric uh, issues. So every story has a beginning and every hospital has a creation. The Phoenix Children's was created in 1983 after a committee was um, uh, developed and this had no physicians on the committee. It was the uh, ex-governor and ex-secretary of state who was gonna become governor, the head of uh, Salt River Project, the head of the Phoenix Gazette newspaper and a retired uh, general from the army. They decided that uh, the hospital needed to be within a hospital. There were lots of bids. They decided it should be in Good Samaritan Hospital. And the hospital was created in September of 1983. At that time, you needed a certificate of need for hospital beds. And even though the committee stated that the hospital should probably be a good SAM, there were a lot of hospitals that applied for that certificate of need. The state denied all of them. And Good SAM basically gave 78 beds to Phoenix Children's that started the hospital. Okay, right down the road. Okay, you can still notice the building. The, the building on the left is the, um, the outpatient center, which is behind that uh, Google page. That was where our clinics were. And the hospital at Phoenix Children's was actually on the fourth, uh, the third, and the eighth floor of, um, of this uh, tower. My story of the first patient with Duchenne's though does not begin in the hospital or the clinic. It begins across the street in a urgent care surgical center, which was we were doing outpatient surgery in 1986. Okay, So Dr. Kaplan here brought me to Phoenix in 1986. Joe Zarello was a pediatric surgeon here who's not in practice now, who basically went to perform an orchiopexy on an eight-year-old boy across the street in that surgical care center. Um, during the induction of anesthesia, he had a cardiac arrest. He had a CPK of 150,000. He was transferred across the street into the ICU. 
uh, where I was called to see him by Dr. David Bader, who basically now is a, a bioethics professor at the University of Arizona, but was involved in establishing the um, intensive care unit uh, here at the Phoenix Children's. As I went into the room to see this patient, the mother pulled out these three pictures. You have to realize this was long before cell phones or cell phone pictures. It was even before Blackberries. I mean, um, she pulled out these pictures from her wallet and these are the same three pictures that she showed me. And she related a history that has been told since the beginning, long before the beginning of the hospital. And that is her child was absolutely normal. He had neck uh, uh, eccentric strength that was normal. He rolled at five months. His birth history was normal. His, he was walking late and he was evaluated quite early because of his language delay, because of his verbal and performance difficulties. He was subsequently forming evaluated and had scores that were much lower than normal. He was put on stimulant medication. He had an abnormal liver profile. He was taken off the stimulant medications because his abnormal liver profile was interpreted as being liver disease rather than muscle disease. So this story is a story that we hear probably more than 50% of our patients with Duchenne's as far as presentation. Okay. This became so problematic that um, um, the uh, CDC got involved, okay, which I will go over in just a few minutes. During the time that, that this patient presented though, uh, Eric Hoffman was working in Lou Hunkel's laboratory in Boston, and he was just in the process of isolating the gene for Duchenne's. Okay, so that was in 1987. They found the protein along the muscle membrane one year later. And again, this was before internet. So what, what usually would happen at that time is the researchers would travel around the country and give grand rounds. And he traveled to Tucson. I was invited to Tucson to bring a patient to present. I took Gordon down there with his family and presented them to, to Dr. Hoppen. And he said before this, he said, well, I'll sequence his gene. And he did. And in his lab, he had a deletion in the dystrophin gene, okay? The next year in his lab, uh, Monaco described a process of in-frame or out-of-frame deletions as being quantitative as far as how much protein you would make and how great or severe or mild your disease was. And we still call that the Monaco rule or the in-frame, out-of-frame type of mutation, right? So the presentation has always been problematic, okay? The, the presentation became so problematic that the uh, CDC, the same CDC that follows pertussis, tuberculosis, COVID, influenza, they decided that uh, based on a lot of um, push from some of the Duchesne's organizations, they were gonna track muscular dystrophy. And so that became known as the Muscular Dystrophy um, Surveillance Tracking and Research Network or MD StarNet. They picked five states in the United States to cover and Arizona was one of them. So the data they were gathering was pooled anonymously to see like how patients being diagnosed, how common were the disease, whether it was disparity in diagnosis, um, what were their, their sounds, uh, signs and symptoms, and what type of medical services these patients were treated. And they began sort of, uh, you know, uh, giving research and publications um, that looked at, um, you know, what was actually going on in the country. And the, the papers that began uh, coming out, basically, I think were quite revealing. Um, so they used three features. They looked at the features of initial evaluation for a patient when the first CPK was drawn, and when there was a DNA confirmation. So if you look at the three features, the initial valuations for boys with Duchenne's was about four and a half, five years. CPK uh, determination was usually within six months or a year later. And then the DNA was probably uh, diagnosis at that time was probably a year after that. So they looked at a linear regression model looking at um, uh, diversity. And uh, the bottom line was that um, if you were Caucasian, your, your CPK was drawn about 12.9 months before um, uh, Asian or African-American. The DNA was about 24 months earlier. But if you came from a poverty um, area, your, your ability to be picked up was as good as whether you had a family history of Duchenne's, was suggesting that we were getting these patients evaluated, but people weren't recognizing Duchenne's. So there've been a lot of papers and, and research that have looked at why that is the case. And I've picked two that are separated by about 10 years to show you that really nothing has changed. This is a group at Hopkins that looked at the motor and cognitive delay in Duchenne's implications for early diagnosis. And they just looked at two features. When does a boy with Duchenne's walk? 
in when does a boy um, do, with Duchenne's, uh, whether in a normal classroom or not. And it looked like that the boys who walked later had more cognitive dysfunction. And if they walked on time, they had less cognitive dysfunction. So the suggestion here was that um, if you were cognitively or language delayed, you got those symptoms picked up early, but you were not you were not recognized as having Duchenne's. So the plea at this uh, paper was that just do a CPK on a boy who's developmentally delayed. I mean, probably should be done at the same time you're looking at fragile X. Well, so um, so this goes on about uh, you know just two years ago, where another group out east looked at uh, the prevalence of co-occurring neurocognitive diagnoses in boys with Duchenne's, and it looked like that the more co-occurring diagnoses, the later their diagnosis. So here we're talking about two years ago in a major Duchenne center where the average population was diagnosed at 5.9 years. Okay. The more core occurring diagnosis, the later the diagnosis. So if you had autism spectrum disorder, ADHD, uh, intellectual impairment, or speech and language disorder, you were diagnosed later with Duchenne's, even though you probably were picked up earlier looking at those symptoms. Again, autism, common finding with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. Right. So um, here's what I call my first revelation. Duchenne's diagnosis odyssey is incredibly long. It's not changed in four decades. It's not changed since John Hartley was a resident. Okay. There are disparities in diagnosis that have not changed. We assess development delay early and we don't recognize Duchenne's. Okay. Some walk on time, some have autism. A lot of them have nerve development disorders. It's just not something that's clinically found by most physicians. All right, why is that? Well, because it's a rare disorder. I mean, in, in all honesty, one in 5,000 male births is not common, but it is the most common muscular dystrophy, okay? Um, it's commonly associated with respiratory problems, eventually cardiac failure. Uh, it's X-linked, so the mothers are carriers. Um, there's a, it, the empty StarNet data, was there about 160 patients in Arizona, um, you know, in 2011? There's only about 17,000 in the uh, United States, and 30,000 uh, if you include Europe, maybe less than 200,000 in the world, 200 to 300,000. So it's not, not a common problem. Okay. All right. So the, the creation of Phoenix Children's Hospital, I think, was, you know, uh, uh, now uh, you, you probably realize uh, where it came from. What happened was that um, the move to this campus was in 2002. And that's called a lot of things. The, in, the, in the history of feeding children, they call it the breaking new grounds and overcoming challenges. I call it the great migration, the exodus, uh, kicking out of the sandbox. I mean, they, they kicked this sort of out. And they came to this campus in 2002. This was originally um, um, a uh, uh, what was called Phoenix Regional Medical Center. And as soon as we got over here, um, there were problems. There were a lot of problems that, uh, you know, because of a new hospital, but um, the great flood was probably the, the major problem. Within a two months of getting here, there was a rain for, it wasn't 40 days or 40 nights. It was like just one day, but, there, but there's the picture out there and the roof here probably uh, sprang a little bit of leaks and the whole first floor over in the East building basically was underwater. The, you know, the ORs were closed. It was, it was, it was a mess. Um, how does that, what does that have to do with Duchesne's? Well, I think from every type of um, uncertainty comes um, new ground and new information. And I've separated the Duchesne's issue into four topics that I think now we have a good understanding for. They're steroids. Every resident who I've ever met basically will ask me the question, and I appreciate it. But do you sure you want to do this? I mean, this is really a <laughs> Like there's side effects, I man. You know, are. is it is it worth it? And and I I appreciate. It. In fact, I get upset if people don't ask with me longer. Okay. And then, we, what is the real natural history of this? I mean, in order to know whether you can treat something, you have to know what what the real natural history is. And it, why is it variable? It, it, it's incredibly variable. And why do people progress at different rates? And why do people lose muscle function? So I'm going to go through these four um, topics fairly quickly to give you guys some idea of. Um, of um, why we're doing what we're doing. All right, so let's talk about practice parameters. As early as uh, 2005, the, the American Academy of Neurology and Subcommittee of Child Neurology suggested 
offer boys steroids. Offer boys steroids, talk about side effects. They give a dose, which is probably not important at this point. It's 0.75 milligrams per kilogram daily. We dose some kids with high dose treatment. So MD Starnet is looking at data. They're looking at data. They're looking at Arizona. So this was a meeting in 2008 where they looked at the use of steroids in boys with Duchenne's. And Arizona was not, um, you know, we're not any worse than Colorado, maybe a little worse than Iowa. We certainly uh, weren't treating most boys in 2008. Okay. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. I can't, I can't hear you. Yeah, why does only half of New York highlight? Oh, because there's, um, so New York has, a, uh, there's, there's a, a group who is um, uh, very involved in Duchesne's and so that they use that group, okay? So it's not like that, that, that New York was, New York is way ahead of everything with Duchesne's as you'll see, but there's a particular group, I think out of uh, Northern, uh, I think it's Rochester basically, that there were some researchers there that were part of by MD Starnet. In the Starnet has probably changed now, so it's not only um, these states. In fact, Arizona's been taken out fairly recently, but they're still reporting data, which you'll, and I'll show you some maybe in a little while. So anyway, so the, 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 the second point here is that steroid molecule can be tweaked, and that's really important for, at the end of this talk. So the second steroid that really... Um, uh, or the first story that was approved was a medicine called the Flazaport. And the study that was done to look at that was randomized, placebo, blindedly controlled. You don't see studies like that in these things. So that was done in 1995. So the drug works just as well, probably as prednisone. It has some benefits. It has some so more side effects like cataracts. I don't think the drug at this point is, in, is important, but uh, what's important is that you can change the molecule to change um, side effects and subsequently change function. So this is thought to have somewhat less suppressive activity, um, less weight gain, and probably other uh, similar side effects with a little bit of dose. But what's important about the Flaxacore is that this made the halls of Congress because once it was approved, and it has been approved um, uh, by the FDA for treatment down to age two years, okay, um, the price really was exorbitant. And the company that actually bought this didn't do any research. They just bought this and got it approved for a study that was probably 15 years old. So Bernie Sanders and Elijah Cummings on the house, they just went, you know, um, they, they, they really went after this. And actually, uh, as, a, as a, uh, an example of, um, you know, uh, medical uh, overcharging. And uh, eventually the price was lowered, the company was sold, and the flazaport has been out there as a treatment. So here's the bottom line. 15, 20 years later, we have good data on why we use steroids. Okay. So if you ask a boy with Duchenne's what's important to them, yeah, some of them will say, I want to walk longer. What they really say is that if I could use my hands and arms 10 years longer, I would do anything. So standing from supine, loss of ambulation are clearly improved with long-term steroids, but overhead reach, you can prolong a boy's overhead reach by sometimes five and maybe up to eight or nine years by daily steroid use. Okay. So again, at this point, that is the recommendation and that's what we're doing. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about variability and diagnosis. So, um, and I believe that... Um, you know, we see. So th there's a significant expansion and growth of Phoenix Children's Hospital. Okay? And this is, um, you know, part of the turnaround when, when Bob Myers came here. Um, they talk about expansion and growth in 2000 with satellite clinics opening up. But as John said, I've been here a long time and I've been to a lot of satellite clinics. So I can tell you in 1997, that's a satellite clinic on the west side across the Brandon Thunderbird. This is a satellite clinic on the west side. This is Scottsdale in 2000. Scottsdale more recently, the ambulatory building here and the East Valley. So um, expansion is important. I show you this slide, not because of expansion. If you notice that this is not a cap chat to get your, 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 your password, this is um, a way that we look at function of these chains. And all these places have in common a 10 meter hall a 10 meter hall that you can watch a patient run in time. And that tends to be a big feature as far as uh, Duchenne's. Okay. 
So what is the real natural history? We have very simple ways now of looking at um, function in Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. Um, in about a 10 or 12 minute visit, you can do what's called a North Star ambulatory assessment, which I use basically on lots of patients. So there's 17 tasks here that you can have people do. You can have them stand, you can have them walk, you can have them sit in a chair and try to get up. So 17 tasks, you get two points if you can do it normally, one point if you do it with accommodations. If you can't do it, you get zero points. Like getting off the floor, where you can't get off the floor, you got zero points. If you can jump and get both feet off the ground, you get two points. So 34 is a maximum score. Okay, so if you look at boys with Duchenne's, okay, um, the average boy with Duchenne's probably has a score of about 20, 22, 24, 26. But if you follow them sequentially, I think you, what you'll see here is that patients get better before they get worse. Okay, that one statement um, in knowing that probably, or, or we're not knowing that, probably costs millions and millions of dollars in trials that were not. Uh, positive because we didn't know really when we were treating boys and they weren't uh, they weren't uh, stratified because of function. So if you're treating somebody down here, you don't uh, expect them to get better, but stability may be something you would ask. If you're treating somebody upslope, they're getting better anyway, so it may be hard to tell. So the point is that uh, the natural history of Duchenne's now has been told. All right, so to understand the variability, you also need to understand what is Duchenne's muscular dystrophy? So this is the protein. It's attached down here to a sarcomere um, at this um, end terminal, and it's attached uh, the other side to the cell membrane. Okay, It acts like an axle. So as your sarcomere moves back and forth, I mean, this axle basically stabilizes your muscle membrane. And if that's broken, your muscle membrane gets injured or damaged. Okay, And the more damage starts a process which um, that we'll talk about in just a few minutes. Okay. So the other thing that you need to know about the gene for Duchenne's, I mean, it's, it is the biggest gene in the body. I mean, it's huge. Um, it's uh, so big that you can't really put the whole thing in a viral vector, which we'll talk about at the end. But there's 79 exons, and depending on the type of mutation you have, really depends on how much protein you make and what severity of disease you have. So um, if you have an in-frame mutation, you tend to make more protein because of the messenger RNA can be read, out, out of frame mutations, you don't make any. Stop codons, you're not expected to make any protein, and they're usually more severe. Um, there are lots of other mutations, frame shifts, deletions, splice mutations. Um, these idea of these promoters, there's multiple promoters, which are areas in the gene that make different types of dystrophin. Um, that has turned out to be probably one of the most astounding features of Duchenne's that wasn't recognized. And I'll give you some examples of that uh, in the talk that I think are quite cool. All right, so understanding the disease variability. I have two videos here I will show you. These are uh, based on uh, boys who are walking uh, 10 meters. And you know, from a, a pediatric point of view, if you had every child go down a 10 meter hall, I don't think you would ever miss a boy with Duchenne's in your clinic. I mean, so here's the typical run of a four and a uh, three, 12 year old who has an out of frame mutation. He has normal cardiac function. Um, and he's been followed to 16 years with normal cardiac function. Uh, he began, he stopped walking at age nine. So let's see a double phase walk with his arms going back and forth. I mean, that's a typical, what we call Duchenne's jog. Walking like that, he would get one star on a, um, a one point on a North star, okay? And here's a boy who's seven, who has a 44 out of frame deletion. Um, uh, and if you watch him walk, this is a little bit different. So he's up on his toes, but he doesn't have the jog. Okay? So he has milder disease, he's over, he has an out of frame del deletion, expecting he would not make a lot of protein. Okay? So, and these are the, the where they show up on a, typical six minute walk if you extrapolate that to what's norm. They're both less than normal, but obviously the older boy has done a lot better than the younger boy. Again, variability of disease, not, not really well explained. Okay. The other thing that people talk about is, you know, you, you we talk about it as being a Gower's maneuver um, to, to neurologists, neuromuscular neurologists, it's time to stand. All right, so here are two individuals. This is a 24 month old, who has a exon 37 deletion, which is out of frame, okay? 
So he's expected not to make any protein. But if you watch him get up, he doesn't use his hands at all. Okay. He's he's pretty good. Okay. Now his grandfather walked till he was 30. Okay. And here's a more typical individual who gets up um, off the floor, you know, in about 4.8 seconds. Okay. He uses his hand up on his hip. Okay. Um, that time greater than five seconds of getting off the floor is a marker for us being non-ambulatory within about two years, okay? So we use these things in the clinic. It's very easy to, to, to accept lives uh, courses based on that. So why do people with these chains get weak? They get weak because that muscle membrane is damaged. That starts a process of um, muscle injury, calcium leak, activation of proteases, damage, um, uh, inflammation, scar tissue, fibrosis, decreased generation or regeneration and a process that basically has started literally within at birth. You biopsy babies in one or two months, you're going to see changes already. CPKs at birth are in the tens of thousands. By two or three months, you're in the 24 to 40,000. It's not a, a hard test to do. Okay. So there's one more aspect of variability that I want to mention, and that's... Um, I think examine here, here. These are fraternal twins, all right? So um, uh, one was non-ambulatory at 10, no contractures in his arm. Other one is non-ambulatory at 11, but has a significant contracture in his arm. Again, why, how, what does this mean? All right, so the point here, and I'm not gonna belabor it because of time, is it that, uh, yes, the gene for Duchenne's causes muscular dystrophy, but there's all sorts of other genetic modifiers that now have been identified that either relate to fibrosis or inflammation. And depending on um, what variability you have, and I will um, give you some data just on this uh, first uh, gene, which is called osteopontin. So it turns out that uh, it's, it helps in muscle regeneration and causes less inflammation. If you have a certain phenotype of that, um, that gene, you um, actually uh, do better or do worse depending on the phenotype, but you also don't respond to steroids as well. So again, a lot of the variability in Duchenne's is now being identified as being not related to the genes for dystrophin. Okay, all right. So here are the relevations, relevations um, two to five. Steroids work, they work well. We pay a terrible price. Uh, we need something better. And here's a picture of these compression fractures of the spine that we do these x-rays once a year in the clinic. And we follow this quite closely because if you start seeing any of this, it never gets better. And that's, you know, recommendations for treatment. Okay, boys with Duchenne's get better before they get worse. There's significant variability in onset of disease um, and contractors response to treatment we talked a little bit about. And muscle loss is secondary to inflammation, regeneration, fibrosis, and it's altered by other genetic modifiers. And this is a little chart that basically showed you what we were talking about before. If you're treating somebody on the upslope, you're probably not gonna be able to tell whether you're being treated. If you're treating on the downslope, stability is improvement, okay? All right, so here's the biggie. Alliance, partnership, and what I call the merger, okay? So in November of 2011, Phoenix Children's pursued a landmark alliance with St. Joseph Hospital and Medical Center to bring the pediatric program here to Phoenix Children's, the whole program. I think there were 450 individuals, nurses, doctors, therapists, you name it, all coming this way. Um, so that also brought the Bears Neurological Institute specialists here. So here's, here's a picture of some of my um, subsequent partners. I mean, Tracer Cardenas, Kara Lewis, um, uh, Rena Rostogi here, who was a fellow at that time, who's now here. And here are us, a big party with Dr. Kaplan retiring in 2016 um, that brought um, all of us together. Uh, it's been a, really an incredible experience to have this group of people here. It brought the training program here. And what it brought for me was every boy basically north of Tucson with Duchesne's muscular dystrophy in our unit. Okay. It's been, been an incredible experience. So when I think about this entity, there's only one patient that I will, I will tell you about. And that is a patient who spanned both institutions. Uh, and it was a really uh, an eye-opening experience to me, but it happened three times before in my career, right? So here's a 15-year-old, okay? 
who came into the clinic with a CPK that was high. It was about two years after the merger. When I finished his evaluation, I walked out of the room. The patient had no neuromuscular signs or symptoms at all. And the patient was actually pretty irritated. I mean, he said, I'm not sick. I don't know why I'm here. Um, and then he took off his shirt and showed me the scar. Okay. And he says, I'm faster than you are. And he ran down the hall. Not sick. Okay. You probably are wondering why I'm showing you this. All right. So this patient came from the pediatric heart center, um, which was the same group of cardiologists that had taken care of him at St. Joe's. His history was he had presented here in 2010 at 12 and a half with an ejection fraction of 15, 17%. He got really ill. He had a, um, a, a external device put in uh, after he had a couple of cardiac pulmonary arrest. He was transferred to St. Joe's before we had our cardiac program here. He uh, had a, a Berlin uh, assisted device placed until he was transplanted in April 4th, 2011. This is a normal boy prior to presentation, okay? Um, he had a family history of his grandmother and great-grandmother having some cardiac function. That should be a little bit of a hint. And his genetic studies done through our clinic revealed that he had a point mutation in uh, the, uh, the Duchenne's gene down at the promoter, okay? That first exon is a promoter. And that had already been reported as an excellent dilated card cardiomyopathy in a point where he made uh, enough protein through some of the promoters in his muscle to not have muscle disease, but his heart was totally deficient of dystrophin. So how do I know that? Because Daphne DeMello, who was the head of the pathology here, she, she, she retained his heart and she stained it. And he was dystrophin deficient in his heart, yet his um, muscles were fairly normal, except for leaking a little bit with an intermediate CPK. So dilated, excellent cardiomyopathy as a phenotype of Duchenne's, okay. All right, so talking about promoter defects, okay, and those seven promoters, three are full length and the four that are not, um, brings us back to Gordon when he presented, if you all remember that he had significant um, cognitive problems, language problems, performance problems um, throughout, throughout his life, basically. Um, that's actually a common problem with Duchenne's. And here is a, um, meta-analysis that looked at uh, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy and Becker's muscular dystrophy, showing that overall about 23% of Duchenne's muscular dystrophy had some problems that would go under that those categories. And it turns out, if you look at the different promoters and the different transcripts of dystrophin, and here they are, that if you're missing these different transcripts, the more likely you are to have problems. Now, these transcripts have been related to brain. Okay, so there's some that cause like retinal problems, but you don't see retinal disease. There's some that cause that have, are associated with kidney uh, or peripheral nerves, and you don't see that disease, but we see a lot of brain problems. So there's a lot of energy now looking at different dystrophin transcripts in central nervous system dysfunction. Okay, now that's important because we have no treatment for central nervous system disease right now with Duchenne's. It's also important because if you go back to Gordon's history, you remember he walked late and he had developmental problems. And we always think about that. We say, well, you know, you walk later, you have better, you have worse muscle disease. Well, now people are looking at this and saying, maybe the absence of dystrophin during development, um, brain dystrophin is more the reason they present later. And it isn't muscle disorder. Okay? Again, we have no treatment for that. Now, this is a theory, but it's related to looking at these transcripts of dystrophin that are more brain related. Uh, than, than muscle related. Okay. All right. So the points here are that the dystrophin abnormalities associated with systemic disorders, including brain and heart. And the, as I said, the brain and the heart, uh, or the heart and the muscles, they don't, they're not necessarily discordant. You can have severe heart disease, variable muscle disease. You can have the other way around. It's important to know. There are lots of phenotypes of, of dystrophin related um, gene abnormalities that I've not mentioned. Uh, Becker's Duchenne's we've mentioned, asymptomatic hyper-CKemia is not uncommon. We see lots of boys who have mutations in the gene, who have high CPKs and don't have weakness. They have cramps, myalgias. We have um, excellent dilated cardiomyopathy I've talked to you about, excellent intellectual impairment with or without muscle disease. And then we have the carriers. We have maternal carriers who can have symptoms, 
They're going to have cramps, myalgias, uh, and cognitive dysfunction. So one gene, many different dystrophin proteins, and many different genotypes based on all sorts of mechanisms now that have been identified in the gene, which I'm not going to have time to um, really go through. All right. Looking to the future. Okay. You, th these slides are hard to find here. This was taken out of my window um, uh, with groundbreaking, like short 2008. Okay. Now I think we look out there and we just see this. So there's 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 lots that's happened in this type of frame. And a lot of this relates to manipulating the gene, which we're going to go through because this has really been helpful. So we're talking about steroids. We're talking about, uh, you know, the different steroids, prednisone, deflazacort. And I'm going to talk about this drug right here called the vormorolone um, in just a few minutes because it's really important, I think, for pediatric care. Um, gene replacement, we'll talk about exon skipping therapy has to do with, um, you know, giving an antisense oligonucleotide to changing an out of frame into an in frame mutation. And depending on which gene um, mutation you have, you can get different types of what we call ASOs. And there's at least um, four of them now that are approved. Duchenne's treatment and approval is really um, um, an unusual aspect. Most of the drugs for Duchenne's are approved or approved through an accelerated approval process, which means they're, they're approved based on a surrogate marker, some type of marker that suggests you're going to get better, uh, even though you haven't done the study to prove they get better, uh, or it's not accepted that they're getting better. All right, so all of these um, um, approvals, um, including um, Exxon, skipping Exxon 51, 45, 53, uh, were approved that way. That's a good percentage of the boys with Duchenne's. It's not a cure. They they require weekly infusions. We have about 35 to 40 of these boys who have ports in who are getting weekly infusions um, that you'll see in the hospital um, if they get hospitalized. Uh, most of the infusions are being done at home. In fact, all but one of the boys are being, being done at home. So it's not a difficult process. The medicines are expensive um, and they're not cured curable but um, they do modify the course enough that they've been uh, accelerated or approved. All right. So with that information, the FDA, um, in a recent advisory committee, looked at the urgent unmet medical needs for Duchenne's. They talked about the Flazacort. They talked about the four axon skipping therapies. And they talked about the, the bad outcomes that for every 1,000 patients 20 to 25 years old, 86 are dying every year. Um, they talked about a life expectancy of about 30 years. Okay. And the reason they did this because um, a, the FDA was in the process of deciding where they were going to approve the first gene therapy. Gene replacement's not a good word. Gene therapy for Duchenne's. Okay, so this drug, which has a name now, but we call it Delandrodystrophin Markovarovac, okay, is a viral-based gene therapy that was approved June 22nd in the United States under accelerated approval pathway. Okay? Again, based on very little data other than a surrogate marker of dystrophin production in muscle, and uh, a very small group of boys between age four and less than six. So that's the approval right now, okay? Very small group of patients, okay? I won't spend a lot of time going through the approval process. You can see that the, the preclinical study started in 2017, so we're in, you know, 23. We're talking about six years from start to finish. All right, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about this because I think it's important. So. Um, as I mentioned uh, a little while ago, that the dystrophin uh, gene is much too large to put in, into any viral vector. So you don't you don't need to give the whole thing. You can give pieces of it. And there are individuals walking around at 60 or 70 who have um, small dystrophin, or large dystrophin mutations, but they have the right mutation that they make enough protein, they don't get sick. So they use that transcript. They use that um, um, uh, gene, put it in a viral vector. Um, and infused it one time into this group of boys, okay? And the viral vector is AVRH74. It's a rhesus um, monkey vector that um, um, is 
is is oriented in a way that it will um, um, go to the heart and to the muscle. So it's cardiac and muscle. None of the other exon skipping therapies get into the heart at all. So this is a first heart quote therapy. Um, so the vector was isolated from non-human primates. It goes into uh, muscles. It has low affinity for existing immunity. So you have to, you can't have antibodies to the viral vector um, in order to get treated. So we've screened five boys here, and three of them have high antibodies to this vector. Can't be treated. Okay. All right. Two of them are pending uh, insurance uh, appeals. Let me put it like that. So not a lot of boys have 150 who qualify. Okay. The promoter um, um, is a, is a uh, a way of, of of enhancing production in these type of tissues. All right. All right. So, um, the last section here, I think, is probably probably as important. Maybe it's for everything I've said, is that um, for years. I had an office in this building right behind me that looked over the uh, East building. And you would always see people on the roof. And I never knew whether they were checking the air conditioner or they're making sure it didn't leak again. Um, but then this is replaced by these cars here for the next three or four years, so, you know, the COVID testing. So, so there's always adversity going on, okay? And there's always ways of mitigating that, that adversity. So I'm gonna tell you about three things that have been mitigated um, in Duchesne's. I think maybe we'll change your, um, you guys approach. Okay, so in the process of gene therapy, there were four companies that had trials, okay? And they all used different vectors, okay? So that's the viral vector that the, the gene would put in. They used different transgenes. So they didn't use the same um, piece of dystrophin. They all made their own, quote, microdystrophin. And they all had different promoters, okay? So four companies, okay, um, treat their patients, and <laughs> quite quickly, there were problems. There were at least five patients that there were over these four companies who got really, really sick. And they all had the same sort of uh, phenotype. They um, had extremity weakness, bulbar weakness. It occurred about three to seven weeks after treatment. Um, some had severe respiratory distress. It appeared to be some type of Im immunological response. Uh, they all ended up surviving but they required really aggressive therapy. The hypothesis at this time was that there was a T cell immunity to the transgene product. They were reacting to the protein that was being made. So here you're talking about four different companies, four different you know, things. They all had the same problem. What did those patients have in common? Okay. They all had mutations down in this um, internal region usually from about eight, from about exon one to 17. Okay. All of those patients have been excluded from trials and from therapy, okay? So here's another group now that's not gonna be treated. Now, th this is an unusual problem. I mean, you know, who, who gets immunity to their own protein? And so um, that, you know, you would think, well, if they haven't been exposed to it, why would they get it? But the, the answer is, and it was identified by Jerry Mandel like 10 years ago when he started all this research, is that there are boys who have mutations who your, your DNA mechanism of making protein is not perfect. In fact, if you biopsy many boys with Duchenne, you'll see biopsies like this that have these fibers that stain for dystrophin. So there, some boys are making their own dystrophin, even though they, they shouldn't be. So two of these boys in this trial never got treated and yet had lymphocytes that were against their own protein. Right. So, so the question is how often does that happen in regular Duchenne's? And the answer is it happens a lot. It, it wasn't known. About seven to eight percent of the boys have T cell immunity to their own dystrophin that's being made. Okay. Um, and most of these boys were on steroids anyway. So that's a concept that I think is new to us. Are, are we treating boys who, you know, with steroids? who have some degree of autoimmunity to the strophin that we didn't think they were making, who are actually making. In the trials, it was really obvious, and those boys have been excluded. Okay, so that's number one. Number two, I think, is a phenomenal story because um, this, this drug uh, started with a name called VP, uh, VBP17. It something became known as Vomorolone. This is one of the first, it is the first, we'll call it non-dissociated steroid. When we think of steroids, we think of drugs that are anti-inflammatory, 
but they also have um, lots of side effects, um, endocrine side effects. And the question is, can you dissociate those effects by changing the molecule? And the answer is yes. But more alone gets rid of this uh, 11-hydroxy group and does not have the um, um, endocrine side effects of prednisone or deflazacor. Okay, so here is the phase two trial looking at uh, safety of amorolone versus placebo and prednisone, randomized double-blind placebo, um, untreated boys, looking at um, height and looking at um, bone health. Um, bottom line, it doesn't retard either. Okay, pretty remarkable and works just as well as prednisone. Um, so no suppression of bone markers, which I won't go through, no change in um, uh, BMI compared to prednisone. Um, it's interesting. It doesn't look like it is any better as far as cortisol suppression. All right now, um, so this is a phase two trial, well, October 26th, which was last week. This was approved by the FDA. So this is going to be out there in the community, literally in the next probably month or two. Most of our boys probably will be switched to this because it doesn't cause the bone problems they talked about. I mean, it's, pre it's pretty remarkable. Okay. The other endocrine problems, we're not sure exactly um, what the indications are going to be. It looks like it's going to be a one-to-one -one switch. Okay, It has a name, which I won't mention, but more alone is the drug um, that's out there. All right. The last thing I'm going to talk about in the last few minutes um, has to do with uh, mitigating the difficulty in diagnosing Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. So um, in 2019, the FDA has a way of approving tests even though it's not a newborn screen. So the test on the filter paper to measure the muscle component of CPK was approved in 2019. So you can test CPK at, at, at birth, okay, on a filter paper from, from the newborn screen. You can test it in blood also, but nobody does. Um, they suggested that, uh, you know, that there's reasons to do this. The trials that have been going on looking at CPK elevation in newborns are quite extensive. Um, and New York, the upper state New York, has, has been sort of a full run. So they screened everybody, basically. They screened 40,000, um, I think, yeah, maybe 40,000. They looked at the best time to get the CPK drawn, which is about, uh, you know, 24 hours. They looked at, um, you know, prematurity, birth weight, stuff like that, showed the variability. They have cutoffs to look at um, uh, CPK. They looked at, um, um, you know, issues that are going to become quite pr prominent because if you start screening everybody at birth for CPK, you're going to find a lot of things that aren't Duchenne's, okay? So, um, <laughs> and, 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 and a lot. So, and, and this is one of the papers that's looked at this, um, you know, 80 patients had or her positive results for non-Duchenne uh, disorders. Now, some of those will be minor uh, forms of Duchenne's or Becker's, but a lot of the limb girdle muscular dystrophies uh, are going to be picked up. So we're going to start picking up patients really, really early. The last thing I'm going to mention is um, um, newborn screening is uh, uh, females. Okay, so so females, um, you know, are quote carriers, but we do, we see symptomatic females who are treated just like males. We have a few who are on steroids. We have a few that um, have denied exon skipping therapy. So females can be manifestors. Um, female carriers are a very ill-defined um, group of uh, patients. And this is a trial that I think is really important. If you look at the carriers, whether they um, have patients or boys or not, and look at their cardiac function, their exercise capacity doesn't appear to be any different. However, if you look at their uh, rate of ventricular arrhythmies post-exercise, they're not normal. Okay. And if you look at their cardiac MRIs, even though they have very little symptoms, they have a significant degree of fibrosis in their heart, even at a young age. Now, we don't really know what to do with those at this point, but as the females are going to be um, determined at birth, uh, there's going to have to be some type of long-term follow-up. So um, the, the, uh, in the last um, five or six days, I've heard that New York and Minnesota are going to start screening next year. Okay. So everybody. Okay. I so I believe that with the gene therapy approval that we'll probably have this on newborn screen, just like spinal muscular atrophy. You know, maybe Arizona is usually behind. We're usually about a year or so behind. So maybe two years we'll we'll 
it will be on the newborn screen. Uh, the numbers, this test is a proprietary test by a company. It's not typical CPK, it's MM, uh, the muscle fraction. They used about four or 500 as a cutoff. Um, again, um, it's a pretty good test. I will tell you that excellent dilated cardiomyopathy in that patient that I presented to you, that boy had a normal CPK when he initially presented here. So you are gonna miss some. All right, so here's our group. This is um, um, our, well, the PCH's 40 year anniversary. It was our certified care center um, uh, award, which was uh, last year. It's a multidisciplinary group here, a clinic that meets twice a month. Uh, uh, people not included here are the palliative care team, the respiratory people, but it's a, it's a pretty um, um, uh, large clinic where you see all these patients at once. Uh, so. I'm going to stop. I'm going to, uh, you know, if there's any time for questions, if not, we'll. Uh... Yeah, for, for a minute. Yeah. I have one question to start with. That new steroid, is that only for muscular dystrophy or is it people going to be using that? Yeah, so it's, 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 it's pediatric envy. All you guys are going to be envy of this stuff. So it's only been tried in Duchenne. Mm -hmm. My guess is that uh, the trials will start happening, basically. Um, if, again, the inflammation of Duchenne's and the North Star data, placebo double blinded, it works just as well as prednisone or deflazacort. Um, but you know, it's uh, and the trials have been going on for like it's not new; it's like six, seven years. So it's it's been. I, my guess is it'll, it'll, people start trying it for other things. I don't know the cost. I don't know how or what the process of getting these um, insurance. Uh, you know, uh, authorization, because, um, yeah. Actually, it, the drug is approved. The Marlon is approved for uh, two years and up. So most most two-year-olds with the Shanes, we start on high-dose weekend therapy right now. In fact, I've been starting people early and earlier because I knew this was sort of coming down the road. And I was telling families, you know, maybe that will preclude, uh, you know, any type of long-term side effects, but it's best to get you on something sooner. It's a good question. I mean, I just think of an nephrologist. Oh, uh, it's, it's, it's the first non-dissociated steroid. Okay. Okay. All right. My pleasure. One more question. What? For gross motor delay, should we be checking a lot more CKs and kids? And they just going to jump the pediatric clinic than we do? Absolutely. I, yeah, I, I tell our fellows, I said, you, you probably should never send a fragile X without sending a CPK. I mean, it, it's very difficult to tell the difference sometimes, especially the little kids. Um, I mean, I have kids in front of me who, who I know have Duchenne's. I can't tell clinically they have it. So, yeah, it's, you know, unfortunately, it's not on your complete metabolic profile. We, I, I can't tell you why. I've asked every pathologist here through my whole career, why, why is it not there? And all these children with Duchenne's will have elevated SGOT, SGPT. Okay. So that's sometimes that's a marker. <laughs> um, you know, we get a lot of our referrals from the GI class.